Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The World Jones Made by Philip K. Dick. This is the Panther Science Fiction Edition. I'm going to read the blurb as always, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs and share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, strange new world. Earth had never before known a dictator like Jones. His body was unremarkable, but with his mind he could see a year into the future. With total accuracy, he could predict exactly what was going to happen to himself and to civilization. In a world ravaged by atomic war, and denied the false comfort of absolute belief by its relativist rulers, Jones offered a credulous people the precious gift of total certainty. He swept to power bloodily and triumphantly, but Jones had a blind spot, the huge mysterious blob-like drifters that came floating down from outer space. Through the unconscious agency of these beings, security agent Cusick saw his one chance to rid Jones' world of its tyrannical maker. Hugo award-winning author Philip K. Dick has blended fast action and intelligent speculation in a characteristically superior story of inventive science fiction. I think what's interesting is that Jones himself isn't necessarily unlikable, even though he is a dictator, you know? Which, obviously, I would, th would say is a bad thing. So before Jones got famous, he was uh, working for a carnival, and I thought that was interesting because I'm currently writing a short story called Am Am Amorphophallus Titanium, I think. It's um, the scientific name of uh, the corpse flower. But the main guy in that, um, what's his name? Rod no, Enrique Lamerte. Uh, he's a circus performer. He was born with a call over his face. So. Uh, this is going on inside the uh, carnival and I think this is very telling like this could happen in our own world as well I'm actually going to read this whole page because I, th I think this whole page is really well written The war with its hard radiation and elaborate diseases had produced countless sports oddities freaks Here in this one minor carnival a vast variety had been collected Directly above him sat a multi-man, a tangled mass of flesh and organs Heads, arms, legs wobbled dully The creature was feeble-minded and helpless Fortunately, his offspring would be normal. The multi-organisms were not true mutants. Golly, a portly, curly-haired citizen. Golly, a portly, curly-headed citizen behind him said, horrified. Isn't that awful? Another man, lean and tall, casually remarked, saw a lot of them in the war. We burned a barn full of them, a sort of colony. The portly man blinked, bit deep into his candied apple, and moved away from the war veteran. Leading his wife and three children, he meandered up beside Cusset. Horrible, isn't it? He muttered, all these monsters. Sort of, Cusack admitted. I don't know why I come to these things. The portly man indicated his wife and children, all of them stonily gobbling up their popcorn and spun sugar candy. They like to come. Women and kids go in for this stuff. Cusack said, under relativism, we have to let them live. Sure, the portly man agreed, emphatically nodding. A bit of candied apple clung to his upper lip. He wiped it away with a freckled paw. They got their rights just like everybody else, like you and me, mister. They got their lives too. Standing by the railing of the exhibit, the lean war veteran spoke up. That don't apply to freaks, that's just people. The portly man flushed. Waving his candied apple earnestly, he answered, Mister, maybe they think we're freaks. Who says who's a freak? Disgusted, the veteran said, I can tell a freak. He eyed Cusick and the portly man with distaste. What are you, he demanded, a freak lover? The portly man spluttered and started over, but his wife seized his arm and dragged him away into the crowd to the next exhibit. Still protesting, he disappeared from sight. Cusick was left facing the war veteran. We get someone who's described as, uh, I th actually I think this whole paragraph's quite good. Uh, there was an awkward crudeness about him, an uncertain twitch of his gaunt body, but his eyes were harsh and unyielding. He was gauche but not afraid. Uh, I am not entirely sure what gauche means. Uh, I know what it means in French, it means left. And so the only guess I would have at its English meaning is either like, left-winged, like, like, um, quite, uh, liberal, or, si like, sinister, because that's where the word sinister comes from, in Latin, sinister out was left, um, because left-handed people are apparently really sinister, I'm right-handed, so, you know, I'm in the majority, I am not persecuted like the lefties, also, totally off-topic here, but isn't the statistic, like, hundreds of people die per year, because they're left-handed, and they're using, like, right-handed things, like, you know, they're using a chainsaw and it's not designed for lefties and then they die and stuff. I'm sure it's something like more people are killed as left-handers trying to use right-handed things than by shark attacks or something. We get this little line, everybody violates the law. When I tell you olives taste terrible, I'm technically violating the law. When somebody says that dogs are man's best friend, it's illegal. But olives do taste awful, even, whether, even if it is a crime against relativism. Get this great line, darn it, I'm gonna spark some sort of artistic sensitivity in your bourgeois soul. 
And then he replies saying, well, don't say I shouldn't care. That's a crime against relativism. You can care all you want, but don't tell me. I have to care too. I mean, you may notice that we live in a kind of a relativist society today. Right, I want to read this little excerpt here. Because security is the lesser of two evils, I say evil. Of course, you and I know there's no such thing as evil. A glass of beer is evil at six in the morning. A dish of mush looks like hell around eight o'clock at night. To me, the spectacle of demagogues sending millions of people to their deaths, wrecking the world with holy wars and bloodshed, tearing down whole nations to put over some religious or political truth is, he shrugged, obscene, filthy, communism, fascism, Zionism. They're the opinions of absolutist individuals forced on whole continents. And it has nothing to do with the sincerity of the leader or the followers. The fact that they believe it makes it even more obscene. The fact that they could kill each other and die voluntarily over meaningless verbalisms. He broke off. You see the reconstruction crews. You know we'll be lucky if we ever rebuild. But secret police, is, it seems so sort of ruthless and, well, and cynical. I suppose relativism is cynical. It surely isn't idealistic. It's the result of being killed and injured and made poor and working hard for empty words. It's the outgrowth of generations of shouting slogans, marching with spades and guns, singing patriotic hymns, chanting and saluting flags. Where did the good times go? So the world that Jones made, Philip K. Dick. So I quite like this little exchange. I'm a minister of the Honourable Church of God, Jones said with a rice spasm. You look pretty seedy for a minister. Jones shrugged. It doesn't pay very well. Right now, not too many people are interested. And I like uh, this little paragraph here, it's talking about his memory. First memories were bizarre. Later, he had attempted to untangle them. The languid fetus had entertained impressions of a not yet world. As he crouched curled up in his mother's bloated womb, a phantasmagoria, incomprehensible and vivid, had swirled around him. Simultaneously, he had lain in the bright sunshine of a Colorado autumn and dreamed quietly in the black moist sack, the dripping all provider. He had known birth terror before he was conceived. By the time the embryo was a month old, the trauma was long in the past. The actual event of birth was of no significance to him. As he was swung or suspended from the doctor's fist, he had already been in the world one full year. They wondered why the new baby failed to cry and why his learning process was so rapid. This is like an interesting glimpse of what could be because I think that's what sci-fi is really good at is like, you know, I guess showing the potential of uh, technology and so here we have the start of chapter 8. This is something that I'm surprised we don't actually have in our world. On the brightly lit stage, colourful shapes danced and gestured. The costumed figures sang lustily, bustily. Scenery glimmered with a high sparkle, a small square of brilliance cut in the far end of the hall. The third act was coming to an end. All the characters were on stage. With infinite precision, they gave forth their melodic lines. In the pit, the orchestra, classical and exact, laboured furiously. Dominating the opera loomed the gar... Dominating the opera loomed the aged, wallowing figure of Gaetano Tabelli, long past his prime but still a splendid singer and actor. Purple-faced, near-sighted, the fabulous Tabelli waddled about the stage, an expression of dumbfounded bewilderment on his huge, wrinkled features, struggling grotesquely to find his way through the maze of shadows that made up the world of Beaumarchais. Peering through his eyeglass, Tabelli grossly scrutinised his fellows, bellowing all the while in his vast, familiar, booming bass baritone. A greater Don Bartello than ever was, and never would be. This performance, this zenith of consummate operatic staging, dramatic force, and perfected vocal artistry, had been frozen for all time. Tabelli was dead now, ten years. The bright figures on the stage were scrupulous robot imitations. But even so, the performance was wholly convincing. Relaxed and comfortable in his deep chair, Cusick watched with passive appreciation. He enjoyed La Nozze de Figaro. He had seen Tabelli many times. He had never become tired of the great performer's finest role. And he enjoyed the gay costumes, the uninterrupted flow of lyrical melody, the pink cheek chorus singing pleasant interludes for all they were worth. The music and phantasmagoria of colours had gradually put him in a soporific state. Dreaming, half asleep, he leaned back in his seat and happily absorbed it all. But something was wrong. But also, like, doesn't that take away the joy of going to a live performance if it's the same every time? We have this little section here. Um, the robot waiter dropped like a metal spider from the ceiling, and Nina turned her attention to ordering. From the bill of fare, she selected an oral preparation of heroin, then passed the punch sheet to her husband. Petrified, Kusik watched the robot bring forth a cellophane packet of white capsules. You're taking those, he demanded. Now and then, Nina answered noncommittally, tearing open the packet with her sharp nails. Numbly, Kusik ordered marijuana for himself. Kaminsky did the same. Tyler examined the bill of fare with interest and finally chose a liqueur built around the drug Artemisia. Kusik paid the bill, and the waiter, after delivering the orders, accepted the money and sailed off. 
His wife, already under the influence of the heroine, sat glassy-eyed, breathing shallowly, hands clenched together. A faint sheen of perspiration had risen to her throat. Drop by drop it trickled down to her collarbone and evaporated in the warmth of the room. The drug, he knew, had been severely cut by police order, but it was still a powerful narcotic. He could sense an almost invisible rhythmic motion to her body. She was swaying back and forth to some auditory disturbance unheard by others. These people exchange toast and they say, To a better world. God, Kaminsky said wearily, I hate talk like that. Faintly amused, Nina asked why. Because it doesn't mean anything. Slumped over, Kaminsky struggled with his whiskey sour. Who isn't for a better world? Uh, we get the wrong usage of your and your. Uh, it says, Max, you look like you're going to die on us, spelled Y-O-U-R. And uh, we get this thing like, people are being sent to Venus and they're being kind of experimented upon to make them ready to live on Venus. And there's like this eth ethical debate about whether that's ethical or not, and obviously it kind of isn't, at least I think it isn't. But then they also point out that when they arrive at Venus, they'll be glad we experimented on them, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to survive. We get someone saying, you smoke, don't you? I don't have any cigarettes here. I gave up smoking, it's unhealthy. I gave up smoking too. I'm currently up, coming up to 13 days, I think. So yeah, The World Jones Made by Philip K. Dick. Pretty good little read. Uh, to be honest, it's one of the highlights from my recent binge of like science fiction novels. So it's up there towards the top. I would give this a pretty solid four out of five. Not quite a 4.5, but still very much worth reading. And actually, if you've never read Dick before, it's not even a bad little introduction to his work. Even though obviously he's mostly known for things like Blade Runner and whatnot. So there we have it, that's what I made of The World Jones Made by Philip K. Dick. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye